I love Mother's Day. I, uh, I talk to my mom often on the phone. Uh, it's awesome how God has moved our relationship from uh, her being the counselor and guide to now sharing that together. Uh, but my mom is very special to me, so on this day, uh, I, I want to start by saying uh, I hope that each of you have a relationship with your mother like the one I have. Our time is precious because there, there's so little of it together. I, I shared in my Sunday school class how today must be for her with one son in Kiev and another in Florida and a daughter up in Ohio and her in Indiana. It's all spread to the winds. But... Uh, I know that she knows that God has her children where uh, they're supposed to be for His service, and that does fill her heart. On a day when we think so many things of what our mothers have done, I wanted to just share, if I could, a quick list of things that you might never hear your mom say. So this is it, if you will, a top ten of things you might never hear your mom say. How on earth can you see the TV sitting so far back? Move forward. I'm going to need a little more participation than that. <laughs> Good night. All right, everybody stand up. Let's do some jumping jacks. <laughs> Just leave all the lights on. It'll make the house look more cheery. <laughs> Let me smell that shirt. Yep, it's good for another week. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> Don't try too hard. Okay. Go ahead and keep that stray dog, honey. I'll be glad to feed and walk him every day. <laughs> Not my house. Been there, done that. Well, if Timmy's mom says it's okay, that's good enough for me. <laughs> the curfew is just a general time to shoot for. It's not like I'm running a prison around here. <laughs> I don't have a tissue with me, just use your sleeve. <laughs> don't bother wearing a jacket, the windshield is bound to approve. <laughs> if I can get more serious with you, I want to share a story. One of the most notoriously bad characters that ever lived in New York was Orville Gardner. He was a trainer of prize fighters and companion to all sorts of hard characters. His reputation was so thoroughly bad that he was called Awful Gardener. He had a little boy he, he dearly loved, and his boy died early in life. A short time after his boy's death, he was standing at the bar in a New York saloon, surrounded by a number of his companions. That night was sweltering. He stepped outside the saloon to get a little fresh air. As he stood out there and looked up between the high buildings at the sky above his head, a bright star was shining down upon him. And as he stood looking at that star, he said to himself, he said, I wonder where my little boy is tonight. And then the thought came to him as quick as a flash. Wherever he is, you will never see him again unless you change your life. <clears throat> Touched by the Spirit of God, he hurried from the saloon to the room where he knew his godly mother was. He went in and asked his mother to pray for him. And she did pray for him, and she led him to Christ. Can you imagine... How many times she prayed to him when he didn't come home. Do you know how important it is to continue to pray for our children and for our community when they're not yet coming home? That we would see God bring them. It goes on to say, he went home to where he kept that jug of whiskey in his home. He did not dare to keep it and did not know what to do with it. So finally he took it down to the river. He got into a boat and he rode over to an island. He set the liquor on a rock and knelt down. And as he afterwards said, he fought that jug of whiskey for a long time. And God gave him power to be delivered. But what should he do with that jug? He didn't want to break it lest the fumes even would drive him back to water. He didn't want to leave it in case someone else might find it. He dug a hole in the ground and with his heel and he buried it. And he left the island a free man. He became a mighty preacher of the gospel. It was through listening to him preach that Jerry McCauley became a believer. Jerry McCauley in 1912 went on to start. I wrote down here. The McCauley Water Street Mission. 
since 1912 to present, it has like 14 story home and another large building next door it that does food and another large building next to it that does training to give men a career that have treated hundreds of thousands of men and led them to the Lord in New York City. Out of one praying mom comes a lifetime of change. In our passage today, we're going to see some uh, pretty amazing things, that, and we're going to really be focused in on faith today if we can. <coughs> this is our last message in the series of The God Who Changes Us, and it's fitting that we finish with faith because without faith, God can't change much in us. You know the passage in James 2.17 that says, Even so, faith, if it has no works, is dead, being by itself. Church, I'm here to tell you that if our work doesn't match our faith, and in fact, let me say this, if God's going to change our faith, He's going to have to change our work for us to reach a larger portion or proportion of our community. Stanley Brown, an old country preacher, said it this way. He said, words don't mean much if we have the ability to do more. Amen. Let me let that settle in. Words don't mean much if we have the ability to do more. I don't care if you say I got faith. I would much prefer to see you walking alongside of me as we practice our faith again. If we reach out in this church, in this community with a faith that is real, I believe God's going to use that to grow the mighty army of believers here. Yes. Faith is an action word. You don't, have to, you don't have faith unless it's in response to something that God's called you to do. That's faith, responding to the call of God. And so it's fitting that on Mother's Day, for many of us, the greatest picture of faith that we've known is our mother. So I want you to stand with me as we read Hebrews chapter 11. You know this passage is the Hall of Faith. The listing of many people who distributed or demonstrated it, if you will, great faith. Hebrews 11, 1. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. For by it the men of old gained approval. By faith we understand that the world, uh, worlds were prepared by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things which were, or, um, excuse me, which are visible. Heavenly Father, it is my prayer that, Lord, as we sang today, that we would hear or see or experience you breathe into us life. That we would then uh, just turn ourselves over to you. Breathe into us, Lord today in this service. Show up and show off. Many times this week, I have been reminded of how fleeting life is. And Father, if there's even one this day that isn't sure of a relationship with you, would you make this day happen for them? So that they would know you and have the conviction that this word speaks about. That they would demonstrate a faith that would be strong, growing, and living. And then it would result in their friendship line coming to know you. Father, I know you want to do miracles in our lives. I know that we will not, as we sang, we will not change your purpose. But Lord, through us, you can change ours. God is the direct us, Lord. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. So just a few things that this first three verses speak of. If I can just touch on some very essential words that will help us as we travel the journey of faith uh, in the 16 verses that we'll cover today. The first point, if I will, can I just call it defined faith? Defined faith. Because if I'm going to express faith, I need to know what it means. And the author uses the word assurance. Uh, assurance. Assurances of what we hope for and certainty of what we cannot see is the definition. The NIV carries the idea that we can be sure of our hope. I like that, the, the idea of being sure of. When the author says that there is a faith, he is telling us that we can be sure of the object of our faith. That we can trust 
in God to do the very thing that he says he'll do because he has already patterned for us what he will do. He's already shown us that he can do it. I have shared with you my parents incredible testimony of faith and how they came to know Jesus Christ as Lord. I'm not going to share it to you today, but I will tell you this, that because God patterned it in their lives, I grew up in a home where Jesus was central, where the word of God was important, where my father didn't just say we should go to church, but he took us there. Where when the pastor went on vacation, it was my father who filled the pulpit for him. And so I heard the word of God not only taught in church because my parents made that important, but I heard the word of God taught in my home. And it became something that I was sure of also, not because of their faith, but by their continued teaching, I came to understand that God's word was important for me and God began my faith journey too. And if we're going to have a community that trusts God and eventually see this community one to Christ as a whole, it's not going to happen because we sit in here and hope that they come. It's going to happen because our faith becomes so prevalent that when they see us, they first think, I'll say this, they're real. Right? And second, they say, I want to go and see some of that real. And when they come and see some of that real, they say, i got to get me some of that. The second word in here is conviction. And conviction is designed, uh, excuse me, designed, defined as a firmly held belief or opinion. It's what I believe or hold on to when everything else crashes. When somebody calls me in crisis, one of the first questions I'm going to ask them is, if everything else is stripped away, if there's nothing else left in life, is God's love and relationship with you enough? Because if the answer is anything but yes, then you are already in a situation where your faith is wavered. And I'm going to start there in how to define a faith that is relevant in a life that's broken. Because without my life being reassembled by God, it can't be reassembled with others. And that's just the reality. I could not be a good husband or a father. I struggle as a Christian to be those things. I could not be those things without God's center in my life. And now that can end you. We need God central in who we are. We need God moving in us. We need God, uh, and we need to have a deep conviction. When everything else is uh, stacked against me, am I willing to trust in God? And I need to be growing that way every day. And then another word that's used in these first three verses is the word understanding. And it's having insight or good judgment. And I love that definition. This is the reason that we have a growing faith is because of the work of the Lord. He gives us sight in or insight. Something that I could not do on my own, by the way. If I had it myself, it'd just be called sight, right, Garvin? If, I could, if it was just something that Kirk had, I would just have sight. But God gives me insight or sight in to his plan. When I trust his word and when I walk in faith, he gives me a different viewpoint. Uh, it's like going to a baseball game. When I went uh, years ago in 2010, I believe it was. My wife will tell me when we have dinner this afternoon that I was wrong. And uh, I'll trust her because she's the mother of my children. And it's Mother's Day. But when, it, when my brother and my dad and I flew in from three separate places and we flew into New York City and we went to three games, we watched the Jim Brown wipe that smile off your face. <laughs> the Yankees by the Boston Red Sox. Sorry, Charles. And then we drove the four hours to Boston and watched the Boston at their baseball stadium against the Yankees for three more games. Now, in New York City, everything is a little bit more expensive. Everything. And by a little bit, I mean a lot. We went on a Thursday night to a Yankee game. Now, I take it so gets our arch rival, and we expected to pay a little bit more. So we said, we'll just take the third deck of their new stadium. That's way, way up there. I need reading glasses. Up there, I needed uh, binoculars, you know. Uh, third deck, way in the back. 
underneath, you know, all the, the stanchions for the last, the fourth deck, if you will, the place where I wouldn't go because I'm afraid of heights. And so I, we went there, and on a Thursday night, each ticket cost $175. Wow. Okay? I could not see that game. That was the first game of the three-game series. Now, we had paid for a hotel room. It was really nice. So, I mean, we were doing it up. It was the last time we were going to be together. My brother was taking his family to Mission Field. We were, uh, I don't remember what we were doing. Oh, we were leaving Texas and coming back this way. I think we already knew that. Or, or we, were, we were going somewhere, I think, is what we knew. So, anyway, we had this hotel room. We each had a room of our own in the central area. It was really nice. So, after that game, because I couldn't really see it. I mean, so you'd hear the crack of the battle with the speakers, and you'd be like, where did and everybody around was like, where'd you go, where'd you go? And there's one guy in that crowd. He's like, there it is. And then the fans would jump over here. You know? So you knew he was just trying to be that guy. But in that time, I realized that my sight wasn't really good. And so we were walking home, or well, we're walking to the train to take the 3,000 trains to take to get home to the hotel. And I said, why don't we just stay in the next two nights and watch the games at that really nice hotel in front of that huge TV that they have? I said, we'll see every single ball. We'll see every single play. We'll save $175 a piece. And if we need to use restrooms, we'll have a lot. So uh, we did just that. And I had the best two game experience of that trip in the living room with just my dad and brother watching that game because I saw the game. If you want to see God do amazing works in this community, if you want to experience the, the love of the Lord in your life and the work of God in your path, it's not going to happen because you sit way up in the seats and, and complain when the, the, the Christian who's up to bat strikes out or, or get frustrated when they don't put the right one in and throw the pitch to the next guy at bat. It's going to happen when you get down out of the seats and you get within a place where you can see what God wants you to do. It's not going to be in the midst of somebody else's place. It's going to be in the center of where you are. And so I want us to understand that God gives us insight, understanding. But then also it says, understanding the definition of it, uh, it's two-part, having insight and good judgment. Now before I was a strong believer, uh, and at times even as a what I would consider a growing believer. Now, I have judgment. <laughs> I got lots of judgments. <laughs> but I don't have good judgment all the time. So when the Bible uh, gives us the idea of understanding and it's defined as having good judgment, I know that something has to come into my life so that it will transform how I've done something before so I can become something that I want to be. Well, before I practiced poor judgment, some of you in here, anyone in here ever practiced poor judgment? Yeah. Am I alone? Yeah. I'm alone. Okay, I see a few hands. Thank you for your honesty. The rest of you I'll see at the altar. Yeah. But otherwise, uh, now I want to practice good judgment. And so I need the Lord to input into me not only vision for the things He plans, but the ability to comprehend what he wants me to do. And that is what understanding is. So if I can have uh, an assurance uh, that is set in the Lord, and it is because of a strong conviction for him, I will then walk in his understanding. Here's the main point of the first three verses, if I can. Faith cannot fully be realized unless we surrender and join with Christ in his call to our lives. So often, here's what Christians say. God, I love what you're doing in my life. I love my church. I love my walk with you. I'm going to be right over here. And Lord, if at any time right over here, you need me to do something right over here, you just call me right over here. I'll be happy to serve you. And then we're shocked when he doesn't call us to serve right over there. Here's what we sang, the song you sang. I surrender. Okay? You didn't say, I'm not going to sing the song because once is enough. But you didn't sing, I'll surrender at times to you, Lord. You didn't sing, 
If you call me in the things I want, I'll surrender. <laughs> you said, Lord, whatever you call me to, I'll surrender. Breathe your will into me, and I'll surrender. Show me your way, and I'll surrender. Impart your hope in me, and I'll surrender. That's what you said. So if it comes out of your mouth, i got to believe it came from your heart. Otherwise, we call that faith worship. And we didn't faith worship today, right, church? I mean, we were moved. I would look around. Some of you were crying afterwards. I get up here. Some of you are still dotting your eyes. So I know God was moving, and I know you meant it. What I want is it to become so deep and so real that it's meant not just on Sunday morning, but all the way through the week. And I surrender means, hey, God, I'm going to put aside my things for your things. That's not always easy. Look at verse 4 with me. By faith Abel offered to God a better sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained the testimony that he was righteous. God testifying about his gifts and through faith, though he was, uh, though he is dead, he still speaks. By faith, verse 5, Enoch was taken up so that he would not see death. And he was not found because God took him up, for he obtained the witness that before his being taken up was pleasing God. Now I want to talk about Enoch for a minute. Because I thought that's a good story. I like that story. So I'm going to look him up. And I looked up Enoch. And he's in, uh, let me find it here, Genesis chapter 6. No, sorry, 5. Genesis chapter 5, verse 22 through 24. A long story. It says about Enoch, nothing. It's in a list of genealogies. But in that list of genealogies, there are two things that really stick out to me that really made me want to talk about Enoch. Because if we're going to walk in faith, there's two things here that really stand out. The first one is this. The Bible says about Enoch, let me read the verse to you first. Then Enoch walked with God 300 years after he became the father of Methuselah. And he had other sons and daughters. So all the days of Enoch were 365 years. Enoch walked with God. He was not, for God took him. So here's the first thing the Bible tells me that just jumps off the page at me. Enoch walked with God for 300 years. By the way, he didn't get saved until he was 65, according to the way it's stated here, right? Because he's 365 years old. He walked with God for 300 years. I'm not real good at the, uh, 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 math. But, but what I know is 300 years. So in 300 years, I'm guessing I have crisis every day. And I know I can be a little bit that way. Enoch, 300 years walking with God. I bet he went through some crises, right? I bet he had some really troubling things. He probably had some really tough hurts. But the Bible says about him that no matter what happens, he walked with God. That whatever crisis it was, whatever tough thing happened, whatever problem came, Enoch just, he just walked with God. It didn't mean that he had a good day every day. It didn't say that, you know, he went around with a smile on his face every day. It just says that he walked with God. So when those crises came, when those trials came, Enoch didn't go, God, I'm done. I'm just done. Don't call me anymore. I quit. Enoch said, what do you got for me today, God? That's amazing. Then the Bible says about him this, that because of that, Enoch pleased God. He blessed him because of his walk. And then the last thing it says is, he was here and then he was no more. Now I like that, and that's true about all of us. At some point we'll be here and then we'll not be here, regardless of what our time that God calls on man is. But what I know is this, Enoch didn't go into the ground and then up with the Lord. Neither do we, by the way. But Enoch just, he was gone. God wanted to send a message to the people that time. If you'll walk with me, faithfulness, I am watching. And I know this. And so God used Enoch to send a message. And the Bible records it. Enoch's story is remarkable, even though it only covers three verses. It's remarkable, even though it only covers three verses. Can I just say this about these people I'm going to talk about? i got two more. None of them woke up one morning. Shame none of them woke up one morning and said to themselves, I am going to be an ambassador for God. I am going to be the one in my community who 
everybody looks up to. I'm going to be a hero of faith. In fact, someday, I want to be in a book called the Bible, where the chapter where they talk about me is called the Hall of Faith. I want to be a faith hero to generations. None of these people did that. You know what they were? They were just common church members trying to get their life for God. If you want to be a Hall of Faith type person, you need not applaud. If you want to be a God chaser, God following, uh, loving Jesus kind of person who impacts the lives of others, it happens day to day, no matter how long you're around. Thankfully, 300 years is probably not going to be the record many of us live for. David's an exception back there in the back, but the rest of us are going to live normal times. Noah's story. Look at verse 6. And without faith it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. By faith, verse 7, Noah, being warned by God about things not yet seen, in reverence, prepared an ark for the salvation of the household, by which he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. Can I just point out about... Uh, Noah here in Genesis 20, uh, chapter 6, 7, 8, 9. The story of Noah is unfolded. I could talk all day about that, so I'm going to. The first thing is, in Genesis 6, 22, thus Noah did, is how that verse starts. Thus Noah did. It doesn't say thus Noah sometimes did. It doesn't say thus Noah argued about doing. It just says thus Noah did. According to to all that God had commanded him, so he did. So basically what it's saying is Noah, is, he stands out in the midst of all the believers all through time. Noah stands out not because necessarily of what he did, although that's remarkable. Noah stands out because he did. He did something. He didn't sit around and say, you know what, man, this church really needs to do this or that. He didn't sit around saying, you know what, some of the people in this church need to go do this or that. He didn't say, I wish there were more people that would help me do this or that. No one just did it. God said, hey, we're in the middle of the desert. I need you to build me a big old boat. And no one didn't say, you want to what? He said, okay. And they built the boat. For generations and generations of people, for decades, he was mocked. He was stopped at. He was ridiculed. He was poor because he didn't work. He spent every dollar he had on the resources that God called him to use. And in the end of time, all that happened was everything else he owned got destroyed by a flood and he went up in a boat. But in a time when every other person on earth turned against God, Noah did. It's remarkable. Remarkable. Keep reading with me, verse 8. By faith Abraham, when he was called, obeyed by going out uh, to a place which he was to uh, receive for an inheritance, and he went out not knowing uh, where he was going. By faith he lived as an alien in the land of promise, as a foreign land, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, fellow heirs of the same promise. I'm not going to talk about Abraham because you know Abraham's story. But can I just point out, the Bible says that when he was a young man and he was called by God to leave, he took ten of his choice servants with him. Abraham was rich, and he was called by God to walk out into the desert, not to a, a place where he was going to build a kingdom, but to a place God would later tell him. Abraham was rich and left the comfort of his home to go and follow God. And I'm just saying, what are we doing? I'm not saying give up your money. I'm, I'm just saying, if God calls, your first reaction shouldn't be, but, 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 but. It should be, here I go. I'm in. What do you need? Lord, I'm I'm down. All right. For he was looking for the city, verse 10, which has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. Verse 11, by faith even Sarah herself received ability to conceive, even beyond the proper time of life, since she considered him faithful who had promised. Therefore, there was born even one man, and him uh, good as dead at that, as many descendants as the stars of the heavens in number and innumerable as the sand which is by the seashore. So Sarah, 
Sarah, the story is told of Sarah, uh, but Hebrews 11, 11, which I just read to you, by faith even Sarah received ability to conceive. Now I want to I point this out to you because you, you probably know the story of Sarah, but when she first heard the angel of the Lord telling her husband, you're going to have a baby, what did she do? She laughed. She didn't believe it. <laughs> it wasn't because she had enough kids. It was because, ladies, stay with me here because it's Mother's Day and I wanted to include a mother in this. I don't know much about birth. But is it easy to conceive a baby when you're somewhere around 80 years old? I see a lot of shaking heads and big eyes. I see some fellows even going, I don't even want to talk about it. Here, Here's the thing. I can understand her question, physically speaking. And the angel really wasn't speaking directly to her yet. And the angel comes and speaks to her. She gets the message, if you will, that she has the baby. It's not the last time God's going to call for them to do something tough either, by the way. Because, you know, we talk about how God called Abraham to take his son up the hill and sacrifice him and how difficult that would be. But do you know Sarah had to let them go? She didn't even get to go up the mountain. She didn't get to look at the thicket that would produce a rain. She just had to stay at home knowing that when daddy came home, there's going to be no more sin. Her faith was excellent. Marvelous. Once she wrapped her idea, her mind around the idea of having that baby, she was faithful to God in everything. Sometimes God calls us to very tough things. I have shared with you how difficult it has been for me in ministry because I struggle so with just the sheer magnitude of what God asked me to do. So I know how hard it is to respond in faith to God. But here's the thing. If you can look God in the face, which none of us can, but if you could, look Him in the face and say, Lord, I'm doing all that you've asked of me. And this message is just encouragement. But if you know God has called you to be a part of something big enough, and you've said any other time but this time. Or this is just not the right time. Or I just don't have time. And I'm here to tell you. God is not asking me to be ready. He brings the ready. He is the creator of the heavens and the earth. He's the designer. Not, he's not just the owner of the gold. The owner of the cattle. He designed them. He doesn't need your ready. He's got your ready. I don't brag on Caitlin much. In fact, I like to pick on her a lot. Let me tell you something about Caitlin. Caitlin, I know you're going to get me in the office. But she's horrible to me. She took a picture of me once a long time ago. And she's been putting that picture up all over town. But Caitlin, what I love about your spirit is now twice God's called you to do something I know is not comfortable. At our women's ministry on Thursdays, he called you to teach one Thursday. And I know your trepidation, if that's the right word. Where's, where's Danielle? Where's my words tonight? Church. Children's Church? That's a word. Because <laughs> I said so. <laughs> not the rock. Anyway. Uh, sorry. So, and then the second time you filled in and taught this recent women's Bible study on Tuesday night. And I'm not here to lodge you. Uh, you're a wonderful person. And I don't need to pick you up because everybody knows how wonderful you are. But what I love is when she doesn't want to naturally do it, she recognizes God's call to do it. And she gives it a great act. And does next. Magnificent. Now I know there's a lot of other stories like that. I know how difficult it is, church, to pick up the things. The second point of living faith is living faith. The last point of delivering faith. Verse 14, I'm just going to read it. We'll be done. For those who say such things make it clear that they are seeking a country of their own. 
And indeed, if they had been thinking of that country from which they went out, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country, that is, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. The true believers, they kept searching. They didn't give up. They were resilient and focused on God. Our worship team is going to come and lead us in a time of commitment. If I can just give you my last point, it's a deliberate faith. If you seek it out, if you practice it, it's going to be given to you by the Lord. It's going to be grown in you. Mark Batterson in his book, The Circle Maker, asked a very provocative question based upon a question that God asked Moses. Is there a limit to my power? Are your, are your problems any bigger than God? Or is God bigger than your problems? You see, sometimes I think we walk around thinking our problems are bigger than God. Because we say, I just can't deal with this anymore. I'm done. It's one of my favorite lines. Uh, well, I quit. <laughs> I'm over it. I'm wiping them off the list. They're out of the will. Whatever it is, we are good at this. But if God is bigger than your problems, then there's a different way. If you'll just turn your life, surrender to God, trusting in Him, I believe that God will grow your faith in such a way, not that your problems will go away, but instead of giant mountains or walls, they'll become hurdles that help you to stretch your faith and build your character for the next opportunity to revel in the glory of God. If you believe that too, and I want you to join me, not in seeking to be in the Hall of Fame, but I just want you to join me in seeking to honor God today. And then wake up in the morning in the same fashion. Would you do that with me? Just stand now and say, lead us in a time of commitment. I'm just asking you, if God has spoken to you, it's time to come forward. If this is your church home, but you haven't made it that way yet, come down. If you just need to come and pray, you come. If you want to know my Jesus, come and say, I want to know your Jesus. I'll talk to them.